Awesome. Thanks, Nick. So um, again, my name is Zach. I've, some of you have probably seen me before, or at least heard of me. So I am the arthropod diagnostician. So essentially what I do is I assist USU and USU Extension with identifying any insects and arthropods that uh, come into the university that, you know, individuals are looking for identifications on. I'll give you a little bit more information, just like web. Link Your audio is pretty quiet. The there, Zach. Lab here at USU at the end of the presentation just so you have some more information on how you can get any insect identified. And my email address is also up on the, the screen here. So feel free to write that down. It'll be at the end of the presentation too. And I'm here to help you guys identify any insect or arthropod that you could possibly think of. And we have many different tools uh, to do those things. So uh, today I'll be talking about these beneficial beetles and true bugs. And I usually preface this by saying that, you know, beetles and true bugs are incredibly abundant. They're diverse. Uh, it would take us months, if not years, to really go into depth on identifying all these beetles and learning all the beetles in our area. So we obviously don't have that kind of time today in the next 30 to 40 minutes. Uh, so I'm just going to touch on the basics, uh, give some opportunities to ask questions, I go over broad identifications and broad behaviors and uh, where we can find these different beetles and true bugs, etc. So some important notes, uh, these are, again, this is gonna be recorded. So I know some of these slides I've typed a little bit of text onto, which is not normally my style, but uh, they're there because we can go back to this recording later and rewatch it and reread things. But uh, again, these beetles and true bugs, they're very diverse and they're very abundant. You know, beetles are one of the most abundant groups of organisms on the planet in terms of number of species. There's also thousands of species of true bugs as well, right? So again, we don't really have, <laughs> have the time to go over individual species of beetles and true bugs today, uh, but we're just learning like the broad identification, the broad uh, behavior, ecology, biology, etc. So just keep that in mind. We're not going to go too in depth on different species. Uh, and there are many different representatives or species, some of which we're going to talk about today that are beneficial pests or both. Uh, so while without, whoops, sorry, Without going into uh, unmuting and asking questions, if you guys maybe want to type into the chat about what I might mean by this. Uh, so what do I mean that some representatives or some species can be pests beneficial or both? Any ideas, feel free, free to throw it in the chat. I'll keep an eye on it and see what we can think about. Uh, and then again, identifying these beneficial insects at the family level, and I'll discuss what that means briefly if you're a little bit unfamiliar. Uh, identifying them at that level is usually all that's necessary to determine if something's beneficial or something else, whether it's a pest or something that's more neutral in the landscape, maybe something that's both, both a pest and beneficial, uh, etc. So, and then finally, uh, with insects, I always point out that there is often, or I would almost say always, an exception to every rule that's out there. So we can say, we can be talking about one group of insects and saying it's beneficial, but there, there might be an individual or a specific species in that group that isn't. Uh, there might be a group of beetles that all look one particular way, but there's another related beetle that just looks completely different. Uh, this is sort of, this is very common in the insect world, which is another reason why it takes years and years to study insects to sort of parse out, you know, where these rules differ a little bit. So we're going to be talking very broadly about these general rules, but just know that there are exceptions to identifying some of these insects, etc. So just as a, a brief overview, you might be familiar with this. We're going to be talking about the classification of insects down to this family level. So these are large groupings of insects. Uh, let's, so like a, a swallowtail butterfly, right? Uh, that is a large grouping of butterflies that are all closely related to one another. They're in the family level. Uh, we could identify them more and more to this genus and species level, but you know, all swallowtail butterflies are in the same family. They're all very closely related. So that's all we're doing. This is sort of the classification breakdown. We're in the kingdom animalia, so the animal kingdom. We're in the arthropod phylum uh, in the class of insects. Uh, order is a very large grouping, like all beetles are in the same order. All true bugs are in the same order, et cetera. And again, we're just getting down to this family level. So precise enough that we can identify the insect and determine if it's beneficial or pest most of the time, uh, but not getting too specific about it. So we're going to cover metamorphosis really quick because I think it's kind of important to knowing what stage of an insect you're seeing out there. Uh, so the metamorphosis is the process by which an insect develops from an immature stage to an adult stage. There's, a, there's many different types of this, but there's two main ones and it's simple uh, or complete. 
Um, and I actually talk about complete metamorphosis first. So the beetles that we talk about go through complete metamorphosis where there's four different distinct stages in the life of that insect. So there's the egg stage, a larval stage, a pupil stage, and an adult stage. And the reason that this is important is because the larva stage in something that goes through complete metamorphosis is going to look and often behave entirely differently than that adult stage. Uh, so you can have a larval stage that is feeding on a particular host plant or a particular uh, food item, and then that adult stage can feed on something entirely different. Uh, so it makes them very evolutionarily uh, uh, successful. Uh, but just be mindful that, you know, if we learn to identify the adult stage, the, the larval stage is going to look entirely different, right? So that's what makes insects really complicated again, is because they're so complex in how they develop, um, et cetera. So uh, the big four orders, don't worry about that. Um, but just be mindful that bees, butterflies, wasps, beetles, some of the uh, flies, some of these larger, more abundant orders are, they go through this complete metamorphosis, but you don't have to worry too much about that. So the incomplete metamorphosis or the simple metamorphosis are the true bugs that we're talking about today. So in this case, the nymphal stage or the immature stage is going to look almost like the adult stage. It's just not going to have fully formed wings. Uh, it might be different colors. That's actually quite common for the nymphal stage or the immature stage to be a different color than the adult. But they have the same general shape. They have the same general movement patterns. They're not like a, a caterpillar and a butterfly, right? Uh, they look pretty much the same. So there's three stages here, an egg stage, a nymphal stage that grows, and then an adult stage at the very end. So just be mindful of that. Uh, it's just kind of good to know uh, for whenever you're out in the garden looking at insects. Another thing I like to do is to really define this term beneficial. Uh, we tend to think that beneficial insects are ones that control pest populations, but it can be a little bit more in depth than that. So if you think of butterflies, you know, we many times will look at the caterpillar stage or the larval stage and say, this is feeding on my plants. This is a pest species. Uh, however, as an adult, as a butterfly and many moths, we could, they're much highly or more highly oh. valued because of their, their pollination and because they're a good food source the first. Is, is the, is the um, so, you know, we want to keep this in mind, uh, certainly mm -hmm. that, you know, pest insects, we consider it a pest on our plants, they might be beneficial for another reason. Okay. And we don't have to think too critically about it, but oh. just, just keep that right. in mind. I think it's something that I enjoy bringing up and it's a good thing to think about. Uh, and uh, one of the, the thing that I asked earlier is that how can some insects be both beneficial and pest at the same time? is that some insects, some that we're gonna talk about today, are beneficial at one stage. So say they're predatory of insects that are feeding on our plants, but then once they pupate and emerge as an adult, at that life stage, they can then be something that's feeding on your plants, right? So again, insects are very complex, right? So just keep these things in mind um, as we're going through this. And before I be jump into the beetles, uh, just speaking in generalities, uh, most of the insects we're talking about today are generalist predators. So by generalist predators, I mean that they're not really going to be that selective about their host or their food item. If it's a, a predatory beetle, it doesn't care if it's eating an aphid or, or a, a hopper insect or whatever. It's just going to be pr fairly generalist. Some of them that we're going to talk about feed on a couple specific types of insects, but in general, beneficial beetles and true bugs are generalist predators. And again, I mentioned this earlier that there's always something similar looking uh, that is in a different family of insects. So just because we're gonna talk about these general identification features today, that isn't a guarantee that what you're looking at is actually a part of that insect family. You know, it, again, and it, it's, it takes years of studying and practice to really hash out what each one of these in, insects are. And it often requires a microscope as well. So keep those things in mind. Uh, I'm going to try to give you guys the identification features of these families uh, really just quick and dirty so it's easy for you to identify things uh, as well as we can in a short period of time. So uh, let's jump into the beetles. And again, it's important to note the beetles are one of the most diverse groups of organisms on the planet. Uh, so, you know, there's many different forms, colors, sizes, pretty much anything you can possibly think of. Uh, the first one that we're going to talk about is quite common in Utah. Uh, two of these species on the screen are common in Utah as well. Uh, so these are generalist predators of both insects and of gastropods. So think of snails and slugs. Uh, so they definitely eat plant pests of pretty much any variety. 
<clears throat> the issue with identifying ground beetles, though, is that they're incredibly diverse. So we have three different pictures up here of ground beetles, and they're all different colors. They're all different sizes, which you can't really tell from the photos. And they're vastly different colors. And they go well beyond the colors that we're seeing on the screen. They can be purples, greens, oranges, et cetera, et cetera. But generally, uh, you can identify ground beetles by where we're finding them, how quickly they're moving, and a couple of other features if we're able to see them. Uh, one of them is that a lot of them have these larger mandibles on the front. So this one in the middle is a tiger beetle. Uh, you can often find them in more sandy substrates. Uh, they will be they're insanely fast. I mean, you get close to them and they just like run or fly away. Uh, they have these incredibly long legs that they can just run. I don't, I don't even know <laughs> proportionally, like if humans could run as fast as a, a tiger beetle proportionally, we'd, it'd be amazing. Uh, so yeah, just keep that in mind. They have these really long skinny antenna. They're oftentimes a little bit smaller beetles. They're very quick and they have long legs. And uh, most of them are nocturnal. So most of the species that we have in the state of Utah are really, I mean, across the world, uh, we don't really see a ton of them during the day when we're doing a lot of our gardening, uh, but they're often found running across the ground, uh, especially at night. Some species, this this one here, this particular species kind of gives the standard ground beetle look. They're kind of black, they're kind of flattened, uh, really skinny, long antenna. They have these big mandibles. We can see one sticking out here. This is the general appearance of a ground beetle that we see in Utah, but again, they're very, very diverse. So just be careful with that. Uh, the larval stage here is rarely seen. Uh, it's not that they're uncommon. It's just that we don't really come across them much in the landscape unless we're really looking for them. Uh, they do live in all terrestrial habitats, so they're going to be very common walking across the ground, even if you have like a concrete sidewalk or in your garden or even in your house. I see these guys in my house frequently as well. Uh, not that they live there, but they can definitely make it inside to homes. Uh, some of these will also feed on different things like pollen, berries, seeds. Uh, so again, just very diverse food sources. But in general, we consider ground beetles as beneficial because they are ravenous predators of a lot of different pests or what we consider pests on our plants. So this next one is a fun one and they're also incredibly common, but unfortunately another very diverse group of uh, insects that we find in Utah. And these are the rope beetles. Uh, these are in the family Staphylinidae. And these are also really ravenous predators of pretty much any living organism that they can eat, that they can like get a hold of and actually kill and consume. Uh, they're very interesting looking and a lot of people think that they look somewhat like earwigs uh, that when I get photos of these in the lab everyone says I found this earwig how do I get rid of it and it actually ends up being a rope beetle you know earwigs are also very common but these are mistaken quite frequently uh, because they have these really short wings here uh, so each one of these they have these very very short uh, fore wings that their hind wings I'm sorry their their membranous hind wings that they use for flight are actually tucked up underneath so on all of these specimens here, we can see that the abdomen is completely exposed. Uh, that is a key identification feature for a rope beetle. You know, we don't have these really long pincer-like cerci that an earwig would typically have. Uh, so we have, I keep doing that, sorry. So we have, you know, this abdomen exposed kind of like an earwig. We have these little wing coverings here, kind of like an earwig, but it doesn't have those long pincer cerci on them. If you see that, odds are you're dealing with a rope beetle. So these are really good beneficial insects that are eating pretty much anything in your garden. Uh, so just keep an eye out for them because earwigs are also common, but earwigs are feeding on our plants, right? So we wanna make sure that we're not getting rid of the rope beetles because they're very common, they're very abundant. Uh, and it, some of them also feed on different things. Some of them feed on decaying of organic matter of different uh, various kinds. Uh, but yeah, just look at the diversity though. I mean, we have these really big ones here, this one, this species itself is probably about an inch long uh, in real life. Uh, and, but we have these really tiny ones as well that don't really look like the others. So just be mindful again that you know they're very diverse. This one here kind of looks like a silver fish labeled with the letter N. So very diverse, uh, but just look for those small wing coverings and look for no pincer cerci, which is what an earwig would have. And you probably have a rope beetle. Very large mandibles too, sort of like the ground beetles. Uh, so, and I kind of already mentioned some of this, but uh, they can be found in pretty much any terrestrial habitat as well, especially under rocks, uh, just on your plants and crawling across the ground as well. We also don't really see the larvae that often. Um, I see them a lot in soil samples, but not really above ground. And the larvae are really, really small. 
So uh, some of them can also be found on different things like fungi, carrion, and dung. So again, you know, we have this rule that most of them are generalist predators, uh, but some of them do other things as well. And that's a common, uh, common thing that happens in the insect world. Okay, this is one of the, my favorite ones. So these are blister beetles. These are in the family Meloidae. Uh, the larvae of these are extremely beneficial because they feed on those pesky grasshoppers, especially their eggs that are in the soil. Uh, however, the adults of blister beetles can feed on plants. So this is one of those cases where the, the larval stage would be something considered very beneficial, but the adult stage that could be feeding on our plants and some of some species may be considered pests. Um, I've gotten, I get a few photographs every year of blister beetles that are feeding on fruit tree leaves and things like that. So, you know, it's another thing where we just have to think, you know, do we consider this entirely beneficial? Do we consider it somewhat of a pest? Can it be both? And the answer to that is yes, in many ways, you know, um, the larva, we really appreciate the landscape because they eat those pesky grasshopper eggs, but maybe they will start feeding on our plants in the adult stage. Um, we don't really see them causing problems. In the adult stage though, they'll do some periodical feeding, some light leaf damage, but not usually cause plant health issues. Uh, so this one I still consider beneficial and put it in here because those larvae do eat grasshopper eggs. And I like including them because a lot of them are very colorful. Uh, so we have this oil beetle, which is very common in Utah. That's mostly black to iridescent blue. Uh, if you go up in the mountains earlier in the spring, uh, earlier in the summer, we can find tons of those oil beetles crawling across the ground. Uh, but many of the Western species are like really beautiful, iridescent greens and reds and oranges. Uh, this one has some pink on it. This one's not in Utah, I don't believe, uh, but really beautiful insects. Uh, for identification, it's, it's often quite challenging uh, because different species look very different. These two on the screen is a great example. Uh, but the one that we see most commonly, this oil beetle, you can't mistake it because the, especially the females have this massive abdomen and the abdomen is almost like three to four times the size of the rest of the insect. Uh, other ones, you know, they're cylindrical. They often have these like enlarged wings and abdomens. Um, otherwise they're quite challenging. So um, just be on the lookout for this oil beetle. It's, it's very common in Utah. It's the most common one we see, um, but just kind of be mindful of them. Uh, very cool beetles though. I really like, I really like these. Okay, this is another fun one uh, that is very common out in Utah. Sorry, the photo is a little bit blurry, uh, but these are Melirids or salt, soft net winged beetles. Uh, and these are predators of aphids. So we often think of ladybugs, which are coming up very shortly, as being really good aphid predators. Uh, Melirids are another really good one. So these are smaller insects, but they're usually quite easy to identify because the ones that we see tend to have these metallic green hind wings and they often have these brightly colored uh, thorax here or pronotum and these orange to red abdomens. And often the tip of the abdomen, as we can see here, is protruding uh, or it's reaching further out than the edge of the wings. Uh, so again, these are smaller beetles. These are less than a half of an inch. Well, really they're less than a quarter of an inch uh, in length. I find them a lot on grass seeds. Uh, so grasses that have seeds on them. Uh, but they're also found commonly on flowers and different plants and trees uh, throughout the landscape. So be on the lookout for them. They're really interesting looking. Uh, they look somewhat similar in shape to spotted and striped cucumber beetle, which is a pest insect. But again, we have these really brightly color, these bright colors on them, which you can't really mistake. Uh, look for that iridescent blue to green and look for that other orange color on the thorax here and the abdomen. Okay, so these are two really fun ones that I actually just added in recently. Uh, and, and one of them is fun for a particular reason. Uh, this one is uh, soldier beetles. So this is in the family Cantharidae. These are a little bit hard to identify as well. Um, the adults feed on other insects, but they can also feed on nectar and pollen. Uh, the larvae are also beneficial in this stage. They feed on you know, insect eggs, they feed on other larvae. Uh, the larvae of these tend to feed on things that are more liquidy. So they like the larvae that are more juicy, we could consider, uh, and those insect eggs that have a lot of fluid inside of them. But both the stages, the larval stage and the adult stage are predators. Uh, some of them will just feed on flowers. We find them on flowers all the time. Um, they're not too common in Utah. I used to find a ton of these in Maryland where I'm from. Uh, I still see plenty of these in Utah, but I'm actually kind of looking for them. Uh, they tend to be pretty elongate. They're often somewhat colorful, mostly yellows and oranges from what I've seen. 
And they also have longer but thicker antennas. So they have thicker antenna than say the ground beetles that we discussed earlier. Um, so just look for something that's a little bit larger. It's pretty elongate, it's somewhat colorful. It's hanging out on flowers and leaves. Um, it could be a ground beetle. Again, you know, if we were to actually identify this beetle, we would put it under a microscope. Certainly we all don't have microscopes at home, but um, you know, they're, they're very common. So it's not gonna be surprising if you come across a bunch of them. So the next one's really fun. And because I've seen a lot of them this year, actually, and I, we always get questions in the diagnostic lab of, do we have fireflies in Utah? Uh, and yes, we do. And uh, finally this year, I've been in Utah for four years now. And finally this year, I went on a mission. I was like, I'm just gonna go find a firefly this year. I'm from Maryland, again, in the East Coast, where you can just look out your window in the summer and there's just lights flashing everywhere. Uh, we do have them in Utah though. And this is the species, the, the, at least the one that I found to be the most common. Uh, and this is, uh, I don't know if I put the genus name on here. I think it's on the next slide. Uh, but they've been quite abundant this year. I went out and I, we just got a comment, uh, a comment here that are they still around? They quit around the 4th of July. I think it is a little bit late at this point to be finding a bunch of them. There might be some stragglers, uh, but I found this one that's in the photo um, about three weeks ago, I believe. So um, yeah, late June, early July in that time frame. Uh, but you know, if you go around some water sources, you know, you might be able to find them. Just try next year. They're really cool. We have, we've had several homeowners actually submit photos of fireflies this year that were on their sunflowers uh, and some other plants that I just, uh, it wasn't, I couldn't identify the plants. Um, so Nicole just commented they had a ton of them, um, seemed to like the cosmos. Yeah, that's cool, that's really cool. They've been really abundant this year, so uh, really interesting. So uh, the larvae feed mostly on small animals and snails, so they're a good snail predator, perhaps even slugs. I'm, I'm not entirely sure about the slugs though. And often the adults actually don't feed. So by the time you're seeing this adult stage, they're not actually feeding, at least most species. Um, but the larva are still beneficial. And I, I, I like putting this up here because there's some, uh, there's some soldier beetles as well that look quite similar. Uh, so how do we identify them from one another? And the easiest way is to look at if that head is actually hidden. So if we're looking from this top view, we can see the abdomen here with the wings attached to it. We can see the thorax here and we can see the antenna coming out, but we can't see the head. Uh, in fireflies, the head is often hidden if you're looking at it from the top. So I can come to the side here and some other photos that I took uh, where we have this, this large pronotum here and then this head is tucked down underneath of it. This is the eye right here. And then we have the antenna coming off of the head. So uh, we can see the head, the profile of the head a little bit better in this left photo. So the head's completely hidden if you're looking at it from the top. So really fascinating insects. Uh, the ones that we have here don't really have a lot of luminescence compared to a lot of other species throughout the country. Uh, but we still have fireflies and they are more common than I thought they were. I just haven't seen a lot until this year when I actually went out and looked for them. But it's good to see that some uh, listeners are also seeing them. Uh, we've had a lot of inquiries this year, so that's awesome. Okay, and I think this is our, our last beetle of the day. And this one's kind of obvious. We're all fairly aware of ladybugs or ladybird beetles. Uh, so they're all beneficial. They're just really great predators of aphids, both the larval stage and the adult stage. We don't have to beat this one over the head, I don't think, just because we're all somewhat familiar with them. Um, and I have some photos of the immature ones here. Um, we do have a really common that's species that's not yeah, native, which is Harmonia exuritus or the Asian lady beetle. Yeah, but uh, get that, that one's really common in the landscape, but we have many natives too that like that. Oh, we can still find quite readily. So the eggs are often these, whoops, so. these little uh, yellow cylinders almost. They're very commonly found on plants and I get photos of them semi-frequently of like making sure they're not squash bug or some other pest insects. So just look for that yellow coloration, those cylinders that are tightly clustered. And then we have the, uh, this is actually the larval stage of the Asian ladybird beetle. So the one that's not native, but they all have that same general shape. Uh, they have all the legs up front. They often have some colorations on the, uh, the back side of them. So very just, yeah, we're, we're all quite familiar with, with ladybugs and their benefits. Okay, let me check on time here. So uh, let's go into the true bugs. There's a bit, few, uh, some, there's fewer true bugs that we're gonna discuss than the, the beetles. Uh, true bugs include many predators that are beneficial, but it also includes many plant feeders. So I'm gonna teach you how to 
identify or between the beneficial ones and the, the ones that we traditionally consider pests or plant feeders. Um, all true bugs have a piercing and sucking mouth part. So be mindful of that. It's really easy to see this piercing sucking mouth part on this one on the left. And then we have this one right here going into this fruit. Uh, so um, the beneficial species often have a thicker proboscis or a thicker mouth part. So if we're looking at these two pictures here, this one on the left has just compared to the body size, a really immensely thick and large proboscis. So this is one that's traditionally going or that is most likely to be a beneficial species. If the proboscis or the feeding mouth part is really skinny compared to the size of the body, it's probably something that's feeding on plants. Some of them feed on both plants and insects, which again, there's, a, there's always a, an, ex, an exception to the rule uh, about how these insects work and how these insect groups behave. Um, but generally the thicker, if it has a thick proboscis compared to the body size, it's going to be beneficial and predatory. If it's really skinny, it's going to be something that feeds on plants. So the one that we have the most common, at least that I have seen in Utah is, it looks like this one on the left. Uh, this is a type of soldier bug. Uh, it's closely related to the spine soldier bug. It, let's, still what everybody calls this one here, even though it is a different species than the true spine soldier bug. Uh, they, they, it looks quite similar to some of the plant feeding ones. So the one on the right here is the, the brown marmorated stink bug, which is not native. It's a plant feeder, feeds on pretty much every crop we grow. Uh, they look quite similar. So what I would recommend is that if you do find a stink bug that looks brown, it has this like shield shape to it. You're like, I don't know if that's a beneficial one. Uh, try to look at the proboscis. If I go back, try to look at it from like this view. See if you can see that proboscis. Uh, sometimes it's sticking into the plant. If it's sticking into the plant, you know it's feeding on the plant. Um, if you can't see the proboscis and you want to know if this is a beneficial one or something uh, in, that feeds on plants, uh, you can rule out the brown marmorated stink bug by looking at the antenna where it has this black antenna with these little white stripes on there. Uh, there are some other brown stink bugs though. We just, we don't have the time to go over all of them, uh, but just kind of be mindful that there are stink bugs out there that are beneficial. Look for that proboscis size if you are able to. Uh, it can be really hard to see unless you have a magnifying glass or a loop. Um, and it, it takes a very long time. I mean, I've studied stink bugs. Uh, this is my, the brown marmorated stink bug is the species I've studied for most of my education and even my undergrad. Um, and learning all the stink bugs takes a lot of time and it's very challenging. So. Um, I don't expect you to go out there and pick out if something is beneficial or not very quickly. Um, just be aware that there are beneficial ones. There are plant feeders as well. This I put on here mostly for the recording. You can read through this uh, again if you want. It's just talking about that proboscis, um, the proboscis thickness, uh, sort of the size of that. And it talks a little bit more about the spine soldier bug. This isn't the exact species that we find in Utah, but it looks very similar. Um, so just be mindful of that. And stink bugs are very diverse as well. Most of the species we have in Utah are plant feeders, um, but we do have a couple of beneficial species with this one here being the most common. Okay, one of my favorites are assassin bugs. Uh, these feed on pretty much anything that's smaller than them. These are just incredibly powerful uh, predators of anything that they can get their proboscis or beak on. Uh, so if we look at this picture on the left, this assassin bug has a massive, massive proboscis. They have these elongated heads. That is a really good diagnostic feature. Um, otherwise, they're, they're fairly soft bodied. They look kind of similar to stink bugs, but look for that really elongated head and look for that really big proboscis that you can actually see arching backwards. Uh, and assassin bugs are often large as well. We have many species that you know, get over a half of an inch long, or I don't want to say many species, but we have species that get over a half of an inch long. Um, and they're often somewhat colorful as well. We have some different red ones. We do have some that are solid black, um, but they often tend to be quite colorful and somewhat large. But definitely look for that large proboscis and that long pointy head. Uh, that is the easiest diagnostic feature that'll separate it from stink bugs that also have this piercing and sucking mouth part. Um, but really cool. This species on the left, we've actually seen a lot of this year. Um, I, I don't know why. I've never seen it in Utah. It's called the, they're called bee assassins. Uh, and for whatever reason, you know, I've never seen one in Utah. And this year I've gotten, I think, five inquiries at this point. Uh, so really fascinating. Uh, some of these, as I'm moving to the next slide, I'll mention are considered pests of humans, like a kissing bug is a type of assassin bug. 
Uh, but in general, assassin bugs feed on uh, pretty much any insect or even small animals that they can get a hold of. Okay, I keep on saying that everything's my favorite, but that's because I think everything is just super cool. Uh, big eyed bugs are another one of those. So these are really small insects. So these are way less than a quarter of an inch. Uh, we're probably talking about an eighth of an inch or less. Uh, so they're often hard to see. They're often hard to identify unless you have magnification. So these are really soft bodied insects that are very easily ID'd though, if you have magnification, because they have these bulging eyes that come out of the side of their head and they almost curve backwards, sort of wrapping around the side of the body. Uh, we can see that fairly easily here on the photo on the left, where we see this eye kind of curving backwards a little bit. And if you actually look at these specimens from the top, which is what we normally do uh, in the field at least, you can actually you can see that curve very easily if you have some magnification. So these are going to feed on any insect that's very small, smaller than them usually. This little thing here is a, uh, a hopper insect that is really, really tiny. Uh, these things will feed on aphids, they'll feed on thrips sometimes, uh, so different plant pests. So very good to have around, but they also look somewhat similar to a lot of our pest species out there, uh, species that feed on our plants. So you do want to look and make sure that you know what you have on your plant before you try any treatment or anything because, you know, these guys are very common. Uh, Big-eyed bugs are extremely common in the landscape, and you want to make sure that, you know, you don't use some sort of uh, management option that's going to potentially put them into harm's way because they're, they're highly beneficial. Um, they just resemble a lot of the different pests out there. Okay, my new pirate bugs, I, I guess I won't say that these are one of my favorites, but they're one of the most fascinating to me. Uh, if you may have heard of these before, they kind of get a lot of, if everyone likes my new pirate bugs. Uh, they look very similar to other insects like the big eyed bugs, except they're very, very tiny and they don't have those bulging eyes. Uh, but they do have a very long, thick proboscis for their size. I should have put a, so this is an aphid right here in this photo. So you can kind of get a feel for the size of them. They're extremely, extremely tiny. Uh, that's why they're called minute pirate bugs. Uh, what fascinates me about pirate bugs so much is they, their bites are extremely painful. So they're these like little tiny specks that are crawling around in your plants and they will bite you on occasion if you, you know, get, if they get on you. Um, it's, it's very bizarre why they would want to bite, but you know, you're looking down at your arm or your hand or wherever they bit you and you're saying like something bit me and it's really painful, but like it's such a tiny little insect or like you don't even see it anymore. Uh, I'm just fascinated by how painful the bites of this tiny, tiny insect are. They don't like to bite people. That's not something that's common, but it's definitely happened before. Um, it's just very interesting how painful it is. Uh, but so they feed on these smaller insects like thrips, like aphids. We have a thrips here uh, on the left that this uh, my new pirate bug is feeding on. We have this aphid again on the right. Uh, for identifying them beyond just seeing a really tiny insect that is walking around your plant like a little tiny speck, the species that are the most common, they often have this white stripe that goes along the center of their wings. Uh, that's very, very common. There's many species out there that don't have that, but if we look at these two photos here, we can see this white stripe kind of going across this insect that's the majority of it is black. Uh, so be mindful of that. I think with magnification, these are fairly easy to identify because of the size and because of that white stripe. Uh, so just be mindful. They love to congregate on flowers as well. So you might see clusters of them on flowers and things like that. Uh, but very fascinating insects. I, I love these. Okay, and then damsel bugs. Um, we don't, these are extremely common, but we don't see them or just don't notice them that much, I guess I should say. Uh, they feed on pretty much any soft bodied insect. They superficially look similar to the assassin bugs. You know, they have this kind of long head here. And they have this long proboscis that kind of curls underneath. Uh, but these guys are a little bit smaller than the assassin bugs. They're a lot skinnier and they're all this kind of dull brown color. So uh, just be mindful of that. Um, these guys also have very painful bites. They, I, I've only ever gotten bitten by one once. And I'm, you know, I spend a lot of time around these things as well. Um, so because they're not too common, or I guess they're common, but we don't see them a lot or notice them very often, I'm not gonna talk about them a ton, but just be mindful of an assassin look, bug looking insect that is very slender. Uh, it's kind of small and it has this really long recurved proboscis here. Um, very fascinating insects, but all very dull and brown to gray in color or black on occasion. So um, yeah, very interesting. The species that we find in Utah, the most common looks exactly like this. It's, it's brown. It's nondescript, um, very slender, uh, very long antenna on these as well. 
Okay, so that um, I think we did fairly good on time. Uh, so in the diagnostic lab, uh, we do identify insects and I'm happy to help you out with that. My email is on the screen again and my phone number. Um, I always recommend sending photos to us. I, I'm very good at photo identification of insects. Uh, it's always free to do that as well. So um, I just recommend to get something that's in focus, even if it's kind of far away, it's good to have the photo in focus rather than something really close and really blurry. Um, sending some of those is okay too, to kind of give me different perspectives, but send me photos. I love seeing what you all are seeing. Uh, that helps us keep track of what's going on in the landscape. Um, if we do need to see sa samples in the lab, uh, we do have a very small fee for that that just covers materials to get it under the microscope, get it pinned up appropriately. And then we have this cool new service now where we do DNA identifications. So let's say you found like an insect fragment that you really want to know what it is. We can grind up that insect fragment and hopefully tell you what it is. There's a lot of caveats to that. I'm not going to cover it. Um, most of the stuff I could do with photos. So send me all the photos. I love seeing them. And this is a that's just what our web page looks like. This will talk about all the different services that we offer for plants and insects if you're ever curious or want to read more into it.